the things that uh, Greg and Eugene were speaking about could not have taken place without the NGO industry. And this NGO industry developed as a result of Oslo, and primarily because of the role of the Europeans and the European Union. So because the Europeans felt a little bit left out of the Oslo process, they decided to exercise their influence via NGO funding and began pumping in tens of millions of euros, kroner, francs, um, every year into the, this uh, group of organizations that has tremendous influence today. And I'll just briefly mention some of the ways in which they have that influence. When Greg was talking about the reports and resolutions that make up the dossier of the ICJ advisory opinion, if you dig into the details of those reports, they are almost all based on NGO claims and reports. When you look at the ICJ question itself, this originated from the NGOs in beginning in 2007. So in 2007, a UN rapporteur, John Dugard, who was very involved with this, this group of organizations, first posed the question of the ICJ opinion that is under um, consideration right now. It was further amplified by a group of NGOs in 2009, Israeli, Pal Israeli NGO activists, Palestinian NGOs, some international NGOs. And then in 2013 in Ramallah, there was a conference at Birzeit University with PA officials, UN officials, European officials, and the same group of NGOs that are getting tens of millions of euros each year. And the wording of the question that is before the ICJ is almost identical to what was proposed at this, this strategy conference at Birzeit University in 2013. And in addition at that conference, what else was proposed? The PA joining the ICC, and also the PA bringing a complaint against Israel at the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And let's, let us not forget that that is also something pending right now. And I expect around the time of the ICJ opinion, it should be coming any moment, there will be a, a, another UN finding calling us apartheid and, and all these other horrible things in order to feed into the ICJ opinion. So this is all a, a feature of the UN lobbying, the uh, NGO lobbying at the UN and European parliaments, um, all the reporting they put out. And what's very curious is really from day one, well, beginning in Durban, let's say, um, that we can look at the UN uh, World Conference Against Racism in 2001 was really the beginning when the, um, these political warfare campaigns really shifted from states primarily to NGOs taking up that mantle. So at Durban, we begin to see the lawfare strategy, kind of the skeleton outline of that, the applying the apartheid um, strategy that was used in South Africa, the BDS campaign originated at the 2001 Durban conference, um, and some of these early uh, calls to have an ICC look at Israel. And over the years, the EU and European governments were giving this funding um, ostensibly for human rights, for democracy, for promoting good governance, for building what was going to be a Palestinian state in the Palestinian Authority. And instead, all of that money has been being pumped into these lawfare initiatives. The other amazing thing about it is when you look at the, these activities, they seem to contradict with all of the European policies that European governments and the EU claim that they want to be promoting. So the EU is very vocal to their credit on anti-Semitism, for instance. They've been, they were promoting the IRA definition uh, to combat anti-Semitism. They were the first countries to adopt the definition. They've been actually quite good about um, producing handbooks and, and guidance, putting into funding contracts that funding should not be going to organizations promoting anti-Semitism. Yet, when it comes to our region, all of the organizations in the Palestinian Authority, and I'll say others, are getting tens of millions of euros a year and engaging in anti-Semitic activities that contradict the IRA definition. Why is that? Uh, the, the European Union, European governments have very strong counter-terrorism policies, yet, we see them giving, over the past 10, 15 years, have given more than 100 million euros to a network of about 13 NGOs that are closely tied to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And 
It is also now in the NGO funding contracts with the EU that such organizations should not be getting money. And yet, they are still getting money. The Israeli government apparently is still allowing this money to be given to these organizations, strangely. Um, that's another example. Another example is they promote a two-state policy. Yet, not one of the NGOs that they are funding under these auspices of human rights and good governance support two states. Not one of them supports Oslo. Um, from day one, they've been undermining Oslo. So, and then to try to get the full information, the full scope of this problem, is nearly impossible because European governments guard this information as if it's on the level of nuclear secrets. So, for instance, we are currently involved in a case in the UK trying to get the name of grant, NGO grantees from 2018 to 2020 for one project, and the names are actually available on the UN's website, so it's actually not even a secret, and the UK government refuses to give it to us under the claim that it's going to embarrass the UK government if these names come out. Um, and we see this across Europe, across the EU. America is a little bit better about it. We see similar problems in Canada, Australia. And I'm sure these problems are not completely um, unknown to the people in the room. So I think in terms of moving forward, I think we need to continue to hold um, Europeans accountable to explain these inexplicable policies, why they're doing what they're doing, and also from the Israeli government to demand um, the Europeans to stop these practices.